In this lecture, we'll spend some time looking at several examples of calculations involving chemical equilibrium. For our first example, we'll look at the following reaction, which does not go to completion, but reaches equilibrium. And this reaction involves water vapor reacting with dichlorine oxide vapor or gas uh, and forming what we could think of as the gaseous form of hypochlorous acid. So sometimes I'll just call this HOC, HOCl. Anyway, the important thing to note here is that this reaction is a one to one to two reaction. Let's suppose we put water vapor and dichlorine oxide in a reaction vessel and enough of each so that the concentration of the initial starting concentration of water vapor is 0 0.130 molar and the initial starting concentration of dichlorine oxide is 0.2 molar. We then let the system react, reach equilibrium, and what we find out is that at equilibrium, the concentration of HOCl is 0 0.042 molar. So the point of this example is to calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction at 25 degrees C, and also to calculate the concentrations of water vapor dichlorine oxide uh, that are left when the system reaches equilibrium. So what do we know and what don't we know? Well, we know that the initial concentration of water vapor is 0.13 molar. The initial concentration of dichlorine oxide is 0.2 molar. And that the initial concentration of HOCl is zero. Uh, we know that because the way the problem stated, we said we didn't start with any of the HOCl. We just started with water and dichlorine oxide. We then let the system react and we got HOCl concentration at equilibrium to be 0 0.042. So there's no product to start with. Now note that we, when we have these brackets with a little subscript zero here, we'll use that notation to uh, describe initial concentrations or starting concentrations. So what about at equilibrium? Well, we have the bracketed H2O here, no little subscript zero. So this implies concentrations at equilibrium. We don't know what the concentrations at equilibrium of water and dichlorine oxide are, but we do know that HOCl is 0.042 molar as stated in the problem. We can set up this information in table form. To do that, I'll rewrite the equilibrium and then we'll construct a table so that there's a column for water vapor initial, initially, how much it changes as the system reaches equilibrium, and then what its equilibrium concentration is. We'll do the same thing for dichlorine oxide and for HOCl. We have two reactants in a product, so we have three columns. Now this table is typically called an ice table because it has three rows. First row, the initial concentrations. The second row, any change in concentrations as the reaction or system moves to reach equilibrium. And then what the concentrations are at equilibrium, ICE, ice table. And what I did here is just fill in the table with what we know. Initial concentration of water, dichlorine oxide, HOCl. We don't know anything about the change, but we do know that at equilibrium, the concentration of HOCl is 0 0.042 molar.
So what about this change row? Well, right here, I'm going to put minus x for H2O, meaning it's going to change, but we don't know how much. We do know it's going to go down because there is no product to start with. So the reaction is going to go to the right. So we're going to lose water. We're going to lose dichlorine oxide. We're going to gain HOCl. So you see the plus right here. The really important thing to note is that we've brought down the coefficients of the equilibrium. So there's a one in front of the H2O. So there's a minus one in front of the X, minus one in front of this X, plus two in front of this X, because we brought down these coefficients. So if we now just add up the first two rows and put that result in the equilibrium row, we'd have for water 0 0.130 minus X, for dichlorine oxide 0.2 minus X, for HOCl 0 0.042. Well, the X doesn't appear here because we know the concentration is at equilibrium is 0 0.042. So these would be the equilibrium concentrations. What we need to do is solve for X. Well, this is fairly straightforward because if we know that the concentration of HOCl at equilibrium is 0 0.042, we know it started at zero and changed by a positive 2X. That means X has to be 0 0.021 molar. Let's set up this table again on the next slide. This is where we left off. And if X is 0 0.021, that means we can solve for the equilibrium concentration of water. It's 0.13 minus X or 0 0.109 molar. The concentration of dichlorine oxide at equilibrium is 0.179. And we know, of course, the concentration of HOCl is 0 0.042. So when this reaction does reach equilibrium, here are the concentrations. At this point, so we, we've done most of the problem. At this point, we're ready to calculate the equilibrium constant Kc because we have the concentrations of all reactants in the product at equilibrium. So we write out the Kc expression, which of course would be the product on top raised to the power of its coefficient divided by the uh, product of water concentration and dichlorine ox oxide concentration at equilibrium. We know what those numbers are, so we put them in, we solve for Kc, and we get 0 0.090. One thing I want you to note here is that, of course, this is a relatively small value for Kc, and that's consistent with the fact that when this reaction reaches equilibrium, the reactant side is favored. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when, a, when the system or the reaction reaches equilibrium, you'll notice that compared to the concentration of product, the concentration of reactants are still pretty large. In other words, at equilibrium, this is still mostly reactants. It's formed a little product but it stayed mostly reactants. And so that's consistent with the fact that we get a small Kc value for the reaction. So let's look at a second example of an equilibrium calculation. Consider the following reaction at some particular constant temperature. Sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide reacting and reaching equilibrium with sulfur trioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Notice that this is a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one reaction. 
Suppose we put three moles of sulfur dioxide and two moles of nitrogen dioxide, those are the reactants, into a two and a half liter flask. What would be the concentrations of all reactants and products when the system reaches equilibrium? And we're given the Kc for this reaction. We can set up an ice table, but first we should convert the moles of SO2 and moles of NO2 into initial molar concentrations. So we simply take the number of moles of SO2 and divide by the volume of the container, and we get 1.2 molar for the initial concentration of SO2. We do the same thing for NO2 and get an initial concentration of 0.8 molar. And of course, the initial concentration of the products SO3 and NO would both be zero because the problem states were just starting with reactants. If we set up an ice table, we can put in our initial values for concentrations of reactants and products. And then we say that the way we've set this up, of course, you're going to lose some reactants and gain some products. So we have minus x, minus x, plus x, and plus x. And all of the coefficients here are ones because the coefficients in the balanced equation is one. We add up the columns to get the equilibrium concentrations in terms of the initial concentrations of the reactants and our x value. So using this equilibrium constant rho, we write out an equilibrium constant expression because of course the equilibrium constant expression would be the concentrations of the products raised to the power of the coefficients in the equation uh, divided by the product of the concentrations of the reactants raised to their power of, of the coefficients in the balanced equation. In any event, we substitute in the of equilibrium values, which here would be x and x for SO3 and NO, and 1.2 minus x and 0.8 minus x for SO2 and NO2, and we set this equal to 3.75, which was the given value of the Kc. So now we need to solve for x. Now let's go ahead and do that. Well, here's the expression for the equilibrium constant. And what we can do here is just expand the denominators. So I multiply the, the uh, two expressions here in the denominator to get an expanded expression. If we cross multiply 3.75 times the denominator and set it equal to x squared, we'd get this. And now I'm going to simply collect all the terms on one side. And what we have here is a form that we can use the quadratic formula for to solve for x. The quadratic formula being this expression right here for x. And you ask, well, what are a, b, and c? We get those values from our equilibrium constant expression that we put in this form. So the value in front of the x squared term here is a, it's plus 2.75, that would go in this quadratic formula, b is minus, point, uh, minus 7.5, and c is plus 3.60. So if we put these values in for x, we'll end up with two values of x. Now solving the quadratic by hand is always rather tedious. You can always use a programmable calculator or go online your instructor uses a site called Wolfram Alpha. In any event, there are two solutions for x, and only one of which will be a reasonable solution, and it'll be obvious which is which. So if you plug the values of a, b, and c from this form of the equilibrium constant expression, and you remember that you'll get two values of x because you've got a plus and a minus here. So one value of x comes from minus a minus 7.5 plus the square root of this expression here divided by 
the other comes from the minus, uh, the minus a minus 7.5 minus this expression. In any event, you get two values of x here, and the one value you get 2.106 is not possible. That's the one we're going to throw out. It's just silly because uh, if you used x equals 2.106, the equilibrium concentration of SO2, which in the ice table is 1.2 minus x, <clears throat> you'd end up with a negative concentration of SO2. You'd also end up with a negative concentration of NO2, and negative concentrations are not possible. That leaves us with this value of x, which seems to be a value that would work OK. So looking at the original ice table, our initial concentrations are change row, our equilibrium row, we know that the value of x we got from solving the quadratic is 0.6217. So let's get the actual equilibrium concentrations of the reactants and the products here. Using this x, we get 0.58 molar for SO2 remaining after equilibrium is reached, 0.178 molar for NO2, and we formed 0.6217 molar SO3 and the same concentration of NO because remember both of these uh, were present at zero concentration at the beginning and at equilibrium their values are X. Now there's a couple things worth pointing out here. You can always check your results by substituting the equilibrium concentrations that means these values that we got here into the original equilibrium constant expression and checking to see that the resulting calculated Kc is equal to or very close to the one given in the problem. So we can do that here if we write the expression for the Kc for this equilibrium, substitute in the equilibrium concentrations that we calculated. If I do that, I get 3.74 and the original value given in the problem is 3.75, which is close enough. Some rounding error can throw you off a little bit there. So the calculated equilibrium concentrations are consistent with the given Kc in the problem. The other thing you might want to note here is that the value of Kc, 3.74 or 3.75 given in the problem, is within that not very large but not very small range that we referred to in lecture one where equilibrium is reached with significant amounts of reactants left and significant amount of products formed. So there's a fair amount of reactants and products here. We could say here that the equilibrium is slightly product favored. You can see that from the equilibrium constant being greater than one, but also you can just see it in the numbers. It looks like the concentrations of the products here are slightly higher than the concentration of the reactants. So we'd say that this equilibrium is slightly product favored. Let's look at the same equilibrium again, but with a different set of initial concentrations. So here's our same equilibrium, our one to one to one to one reaction, our Kc value. And let's start, as I said, with a different set of initial conditions. Let's assume we have some of all of these present initially. We have some reactant and some product all present initially, and then we want it to come to equilibrium. So let's suppose we have two moles of SO2, two moles of NO2, three moles of SO3, and one mole of NO in a two and a half liter flask. What would be the concentrations of all of these when equilibrium was reached? And of course, we're assuming that under these conditions, the system is not at equilibrium. We can set up an ice table, but as before, we should convert all of these moles into molar concentrations by dividing each one by the volume of the flask. So when we do that, we get concentrations, initial concentrations for SO2, NO2, SO3, 
and NO. And if we set up an ice table, we can put these initial concentrations right in the initial concentration row. Well, for the change row here, we, we do have a question we might want to ask, and that is, how do we know which way the reaction will proceed to reach equilibrium? If we say it's going to proceed to the right, our x values would look like this. We'd lose reactant and gain product if we assume it's going to the right from left to right to reach equilibrium. If, however, it really needed to go in reverse, in other words, to reach equilibrium, some product had to reform reactants to reach equilibrium, our x values would have different signs. We'd have minus x on the right and plus x's on the left. So we don't really know what to do here. In order to find out which way we should go, what you should do is calculate what's called a reaction quotient. We'll call it QC here, and we'll compare its magnitude to the given KC value. Well, what is a reaction quotient? Well, a reaction quotient is calculated using the normal way of writing an equilibrium constant expression. However, it uses initial or whatever the current concentrations are rather than equilibrium concentrations. So for our situation here, the expression for QC, the C here is because we're using concentrations in the expression, is the initial concentrations of reactants and products. And so we'll put these initial concentrations in, and we get a value of QC equal to 0.75, which is certainly different than the value of the equilibrium constant. So how does calculating the value of this reaction quotient QC here based on the initial concentrations help us in this problem? Well, let's compare the value of QC that we calculated with that of KC. We calculated the value of QC on the previous slide using the initial concentrations of reactants and products, got a value of 0.75. KC if, could be calculated if we knew the equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products, which we don't. However, luckily, we were just given the value of KC, it's 3.75. So note here that QC, based on the initial concentrations, is less than KC, which we know is the value we would get when the reaction reaches <clears throat> equilibrium. So from its initial starting point, these initial concentra uh, concentrations, the reaction will move in the direction that allows the concentrations of reactants and products to change in a way as to make the value of QC approach that of KC. The reaction reaches equilibrium when QC equals KC. All right, let me repeat that or re-emphasize this. And you might ask, how could the value of QC, which we calculated here, change? Remember, QC is calculated by writing an expression just like the equilibrium constant expression, only we use concentrations that are not equilibrium concentrations. In this case, we used initial concentrations. When the reaction starts, the concentrations of reactants and products are going to start changing. If we stopped the reaction and calculated a QC, the QC would be different than 0.75. It will actually start to, in this case, increase because what we want or what happens is the value of QC, again, which uses concentrations at any given point when the reaction is trying to reach equilibrium, but it's not quite there yet, that value of QC will keep increasing until the concentrations get to the point where they're equilibrium concentrations and QC is actually equal to KC and that's when the reaction reaches equilibrium 
and the concentrations of reactants and products stop changing. So in our current example, QC is less than KC. Therefore, to reach equilibrium, we would need to produce more SO3 and NO, more products. In other words, make the numerator larger and the denominator smaller in order to get QC to move toward KC. So what we know is that for our for this particular setup, our particular set of initial conditions, the reaction would have to proceed to the right to reach equilibrium. You'd have to gain more products and lose more reactants. In other words, go to the right to reach equilibrium and get our value of QC, which changes as the concentrations change, finally equal to the value of KC. And these concentrations then become the equilibrium concentrations. Now to see the results for this particular reaction, we can look here. Here's our initial conditions. We've decided that the change column has to look like this because we've said since QC was less than KC, the reaction would proceed to the right to reach equilibrium. So we have minuses on the left plus X's on the right. Here's our equilibrium constant expression, or sh I should say the equilibrium concentration row here. If now we substitute our equilibrium concentrations that are in terms of X and the initial concentrations here into the equilibrium constant expression and set it equal to 3.75, our job here would be to solve for X. <clears throat> if you do some rearranging and a little algebra, you end up with an expression that looks like this, and we'd have a value of A of 2.75, B of minus 7.6, and C of plus 1.92. If we put that in the quadratic formula, we get two X values. We're going to reject the 2.482 because it's just silly. You can't subtract 2.482 from 0.8 and get a positive concentration. So we'll use our X value of 0.2813. So at equilibrium, we have the concentrations of the two reactants, which would each be 0.8 minus X. So right here, I'm carrying a couple of extra, or I'm carrying an extra significant figure in each of these. The concentration of one of the products SO3 would be 1.2 plus X, so we get around 1.48. And for NO, the concentration at equilibrium would be 0.4 plus X, or around 0.68. We can check our values here if we put our equilibrium concentrations into the equilibrium constant expression. We get a KC of 3.74. We should have 3.75. That's close enough for a check. Some items to note about the example we just did. You can determine in which direction a re reaction will proceed to reach equilibrium by calculating the reaction quotient QC, or it would be called QP if you were using atmospheres in a gaseous equilibria and comparing it to the value of Kc, or Kp. The reaction quotient Q is calculated by using the same expression as for the equilibrium constant K, but you insert the initial, or whatever the current, concentrations or pressures are, rather than the equilibrium values. If the value of Q, initially or at any point, is less than K, the reaction will proceed to the right or continue to the proceed to the right towards products to reach equilibrium. If the value of Q is actually larger than KC, the reaction will need to proceed to the left back toward reactants to reach equilibrium. And if you're lucky enough that the value of Q equals K exactly, you're already at equilibrium and the reaction in the net sense doesn't need to go forward to the right or backwards to the left.
At this point, you might ask, does it really matter if we guess wrong on which way the reaction in example three proceeds towards equilibrium? That is, will we arrive at the same conclusion even if we get the signs of X wrong in the change row? In other words, do we really need to calculate Q and go through all this when even if we guess wrong about the signs of X in the change row, we get the right answer anyway? Good question. Let's try it. So let's set up our ice table with our initial concentrations given. And what we're going to do is intentionally put in the wrong signs for the change row. We know the reaction is going to proceed to the right to reach equilibrium. But hey, let's ignore that and just say, well, I don't care. I'm just going to say it's plus x and plus x on the left and minus x and minus x on the right. And I'm going to go ahead and solve. If we do that and put our equilibrium concentrations in the equilibrium row and the equilibrium constant expression and set it equal to the given Kc, rearrange, apply the quadratic formula and solve, we get two values of x. This one, I think, was positive before. It's now negative, but we're going to reject it again because it'll give us a negative concentration here. We'll use a negative minus 0.28. Let's see how that works out. At equilibrium, if we do that, here we'd have 0.8 plus x, or in other words, plus this minus number for the concentration of SO2, and we get 0.5187 molar. And then we get the concentrations of NO2 and SO3 and NO, and lo and behold, we actually get the same result as we got before. So you might ask, why bother with the concept of reaction quotient? And the best defense I have is it'll come in handy later. Let's look at one more example problem. Most of the examples of equilibrium calculations in this course involve the use of Kc values and molar concentrations. We should not forget, however, that equilibria involving gases can be expressed in terms of partial pressures and Kp values. The reaction written below describes a production of ammonia gas, NH3, from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and is a well-known equilibrium, which we will look at in detail in the next and future lectures. Note the value of Kp at 500 degrees is rather small. For now, we have two reasons to look at this reaction. The first is, it is an example of an equilibrium that can be described in terms of a Kp value in the partial pressures of the gases instead of a Kc value in the molar concentrations of the gases. We could, of course, get molar concentrations of these gases in a Kc value but we're going to look at the Kp value and look at the equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressures. The second is, it's an example of an equilibrium problem where we'll find that the quadratic formula is simply not adequate, and we will need to access some probably online tools to solve for x. So let's get started. If we have our balanced reaction. You'll note here that it's a 1 to 3 to 2 reaction. We can set up some initial conditions. So let's suppose a reaction vessel was filled with nitrogen and hydrogen gases at 500 degrees so that their initial partial pressures were the following. The partial pressure of nitrogen of 1.5 atmospheres, the partial pressure of hydrogen of 4.5 atmospheres. If these gases are allowed to react to form ammonia, what would be the equilibrium partial pressures of the reactants and products when equilibrium is reached? On the next slide, we'll set up an ice table and try to solve. So here's our equilibrium, our Kp value. We set up an ice table and we put in our initial conditions. And remember, these are in terms of partial pressures. So we have 1.5 atmospheres for nitrogen, 
4.5 atmospheres per hydrogen, and this implies that there's no ammonia at the beginning. Well, we'll fill in the change row, and you might ask, well, how do I know how to do this? Well, it's obvious for a couple reasons. One is, remember, we use the coefficients of the balanced equation. So there's a 1 in front of this x, a 3 in front of this one, and a 2 in front of this one. And reactants basically are, are going to react to form products. So this will proceed to the right to reach equilibrium. We know that because there's no ammonia to start with. So we have minus x minus 3x and plus 2x. So we don't need to calculate a value for qc or qp as it would be here because we know which way this is going to go to reach equilibrium. We fill out our equilibrium row and then we write out an equilibrium constant expression and set it equal to the KB, uh, KP value and solve for x. So our equilibrium constant expression here in terms of partial pressures would be the partial pressure of ammonia at equilibrium squared divided by the partial pressure of nitrogen at equilibrium times the partial pressure of hydrogen at equilibrium cubed because of the three in front of the hydrogen here. So we put in our expressions from the equilibrium row and we say now we just need to solve for x. You can see already that this is going to become a little scary because we've got an x term inside this parentheses that's cubed. And if I expand this expression, you can see we actually have an x to the fourth in the denominator and an x cubed, an x squared, an x, a number, and on top an x squared term when we're setting it equal to the kc value. Well, the quadratic formula is not usable here because the quadratic formula is used when the highest power of x is x squared. We're beyond that here. Well, as I said before, I like to use the online mathematical tools available at Wolfram Alpha. There is a video available in this module showing how I, your instructor, used Wolfram Alpha to find x for this ice table. And there are some other tips in there about using Wolfram Alpha. If I did plug this into that online tool, I'd get four values for x. Now clearly a couple of these are just goofy. Minus 98 is not going to work. 104 is not going to work. An x value of minus 0 0.02 would result in a negative equilibrium partial pressure for ammonia because the ammonia partial pressure at equilibrium is plus 2 times x, and if x is negative, we'd get a negative concentration here. So the only reasonable value for x is right here, 0 0.02155. So on the next slide, we'll use this chosen value of x to calculate the equilibrium partial pressures of the reactants and the products. So using this value of x, we get an equilibrium partial pressure for nitrogen of around 1.48 atmospheres, for hydrogen 4.44 atmospheres, and for ammonia of 0.04 atmospheres. Again, I don't always do this, and it's not always possible depending on how the graphics work in PowerPoint, but I've underlined these numbers to show that I'm carrying some extra significant figures. In any event, we can check to see if our calculated equilibrium partial pressures, when used in the equilibrium constant expression, give the Kp value that we're supposed to get that was given in the problem. So I'm plugging in the equilibrium partial pressures. And remember to square the ammonia partial pressure and cube the hydrogen partial pressure. In any event, I get 1.43 times 10 to the minus 5, which checks out the value was supposed to be 1.44 times 10 to the minus 5.
So here's a quick summary of the last three slides. For reactions involving gases, the equilibrium constant expression can be expressed using units of partial pressures, typically atmospheres. The equilibrium constant calculated from partial pressures is labeled, of course, a Kp value. Some equilibrium problems, not just ones involving gases, some of them involving uh, molar concentrations and Kc values, do require a more sophisticated mathematical treatment than the quadratic formula. In these cases, it's reasonable to call upon external tools. And again, I use Wolfram Alpha. Doesn't mean you have to use it. This is what I use. Now, occasionally you might come across equilibrium constant expressions with a x cubed or higher terms that can be easily solved without resorting to external tools. In other words, sometimes you see a situation that the quadratic can't be used for, but you don't need to use any external tools. Here's an example. Let's suppose you had an expression that looked like this as a result of one of these calculations. You look at this and you say, well, there's going to be x cubed values in here. I'm going to freak out or I'm going to have to use something to help me solve this. Well, here you can see, if you look at it for just a second, that you can get out of this by taking the cubed root of both sides. And if you do that, you'd get an expression. Here I'm taking the cubed root of everything on the left and the cubed root of 8 on the right. I'd simply get 0.100 minus x over 3x equals 2. And then I could go here and solve for x just using simple algebra. 